Well, thank you very much, and it's a great privilege to share the platform with such uh, inspirational speakers uh, that you've already heard uh, this evening. Of course, as was mentioned, uh, I have a particular perspective on China. I've fallen in love with China. In particular, one part of it, uh, occupied by Shirlin Li and uh, my wife. Of all the statistics that are presented about China, the one which always inspires me is that no country in human history has ever lifted more people out of poverty than China. 700 million, three quarters of the total lifted out of poverty between 2000 and 2010 were here in China. That should make us celebrate and take note and try to understand. My perspective for understanding was not analysis of the economics, it was to walk through China, to walk a thousand miles. Originally, it was meant to be from Beijing, the northern capital, to Nanjing, the southern capital. But I walked a little bit too fast, and I got there three weeks early. And Shirlin said, you've arrived three weeks early. Well, now you can walk on to my home city, which is Hangzhou. And that's how it became, that we walked for peace to Nanjing and to love uh, for uh, Hangzhou. And it was an amazing time. I remember one afternoon, we'd been walking for three weeks out of uh, Beijing. I have to say that there are many things that are said about walking, but often walking, as I found when I set off through Beijing, I was overtaking the traffic as I walked out through the various ring roads uh, to the final sixth uh, ring road. And we walked about uh, three weeks, and we, uh, it was during August, so it was very hot temperatures. And we started climbing high into the Tai'an Mountains in Shandong province. And we moved into uh, Shandong province and into the Tai'an Mountains. And it was beautiful countryside. It's one of the things worth remembering about China. Is of course that a lot of people look at China and say, well, it's an economic miracle. Well, as has already been mentioned, this miracle has actually been happening <laughs> almost every century for the past 3,000 years. Um, we arrived uh, in a small village called Xinjiang Tun. And just picture it, in the mountains, nowhere around, hardly a road to be seen, a few little houses around a little square. In the middle of the square, a great tree, an oak tree. And beside the oak tree, there was a well. We sat down from the heat of the temperature, it was about 40 degrees, and Shirlin sat, and I sat down beside uh, the well and underneath the tree. And not long before people started coming to join us and started to talk about it, what we were doing, why we were doing what we were doing. And as we sat there, they explained that the tree uh, that was providing the shade was some 500 years old. That the well just beside us, was 700 years old. And we were getting very nostalgic about this, and I said to the few people who were there, I said, have you had many visitors uh, to your village, many foreigners come to your village? And they looked at each other and they said, no. And I started getting really excited. I thought I'd discovered somewhere new. And uh, they said, but we're not quite sure. But the person who would know is the old man of the village. He's 95 years old. He's lived here all of his life, apart from two years in 1943, when he went off uh, to fight to uh, liberate Jinan, uh, in, uh, which was under Japanese occupation at the time. But he's lived here all his life. So they went into the field and they brought him. And he sat under the tree and they said, Have, has anybody, any foreigner visited uh, this village before? He said, no. No, this man is the first. I was amazed. I felt like Marco Polo. And to capture the moment, uh, I said to Shirley, and I said, do you think that they would be okay if we actually took a photograph? A photograph? I thought, hang on, they'll get a little bit worried. Perhaps they don't know what a camera is, let alone that a camera can now be found in a phone. And so they all lined up, and Shirley uh, asked them to take a photograph, and they took a photograph uh, with her phone. 
And this was an amazing time. And I thought, I'll give talks about this, just this experience in Shinja Tun uh, for many, many years to come. And then as the photograph uh, finished, everybody, including the old man, pulled out their smartphones <laughs> and started going to Sherlin to ask for her QS code so they could join her WeChat group and get copies of the photograph. I sat there amazed. Uh, but to me, it was the perfect, beautiful illustration of the ancient and the modern, the old and the new, resting together here in China. It was an extraordinary thing. As we continued walking, we visited many of the places. The previous speaker talked about the Confucian uh, tradition, which is so important, I think, to help people understand what China is about and where its traditions uh, come from, just as much as trying to understand European civilization without understanding the importance of the Greek philosophers, Socrates, Aristotle, and Plato, uh, or the Christian religion in that part of our cultural development. Confucius is critical. And so when we were in Chufu and we actually saw the place where he was born, the place where he was raised, and the place where he was finally laid to rest, we began to understand the importance which is put not on self, but on others. And this was important to remember. It was this drive to serve others, to work hard, to be good for others, uh, which was a really important lesson to learn. Everywhere we went, as we walked through small villages, uh, often at the end of a hard day's walk, Shirlin and I would uh, wander away from uh, where we were staying and we'd go in search of some dumplings or some tea in the local market square. And uh, in the local square, what would we see? Well, in Western countries, often you won't see anyone other than young people uh, because the, young, the squares are associated with uh, alcohol and pubs and uh, often... Uh, there will be places that the very old and the very young wouldn't go, but not so in China. We would see uh, them line dancing. In fact, we used to join in with our, our various uh, dancers, dancing in the squares with the more senior experienced uh, dancers at the front and the less experienced watching and taking their note and the children sitting there in front of them and the men sitting to the side playing checkers. It was a wonderful picture. But what it reminded us was that... Young people and children are the center of attention for the Chinese. We know how investment in young people and in children pays off multiple, multiple times if you can get it. And so the fact that you would see children not just playing with other children, not just on their own, but actually surrounded by adults, all fighting <laughs> for the opportunity to look after the child. You realize this is very important in understanding China. They invest in their future. They invest in their children. And you see that then reflected in education. You see the education performance. PISA, which is the international ranking of uh, educational performance, looks at all of the countries in the world and where does it find that maths and science performance is the best? in Shanghai. Amazing that out of all of the countries in the world, China, which still, in nominal GDP terms, is only 72nd in the world, should come top because of the importance of education. I remember going through Suqian. Uh, we were walking through Suqian, and at the end of the day, I would stop and talk uh, to people who were there with Shirlin. And we were talking to an old man who was raking the side of the road. The sides of the roads, uh, the way that they are maintained in China is wonderful. And we saw a lot of these people always working, looking after and keeping the road very tidy and free from litter. And this man was working in the heat of the day. And, and uh, I started talking to him and I said, is, is this your piece of land? And he said, no. I said, is this your job? Uh, are you paid to do this? He said, no. I said, so why are you doing it? <laughs> and he said, because work is good for you. Work is good for you. I agree with that. I agree with that. Hard work. So education, investing in the young, hard work. These are all important lessons for the future. 
But there is another element. You see, China is actually quite a sentimental country. It's very optimistic. There was a YouGov opinion poll which was carried out, and it said, do you believe that the world is getting better? Most of the countries of the world, it was either negative uh, or very slightly positive. The UK came in about 4%. In China, 41% <laughs> thought the world was getting better. Amazing. So 41% think the world is getting better. There's a saying, it says this, we see the world not as it is, but as we are. If you're pessimistic, <laughs> then you won't see the value in investing in the future, and in investing in yourself. If you're optimistic, boy, you want to, you're excited about the future. You want to invest in the future. Important lesson number three about China. It's an optimistic world. If you come here as a pessimist, you'll never understand China. You need to be positive to understand China. That investment in children feeds through into infrastructure. So many people have talked about the importance of infrastructure, the mass growth of high-speed rail lines uh, around uh, the country is uh, quite amazing. And there's still a queue of people trying to get on them. There's no empty seats. Uh, on, on the trains, such as a demand. There's twice as much high-speed rail track in China already uh, than there is across the whole of Europe. That's quite amazing. The investment in infrastructure, we've heard about One Belt, One Road, uh, is in ports and it's in roadways, which have doubled in size over the last five uh, to six years. It's in the uh, growth of airports, which have also increased in size. And just take ports for a moment because here's a very instructive issue. Ports. Of the 10 busiest ports in the world, how many do you think are in China? Well, let me tell you. Seven. How many do you think are in the United States? None. How many do you think are in Europe? None. <laughs> it's remarkable what is happening here. Now, is it remarkable in some senses? Yes, of course it is, but we go back to this point, that China has been a dominant economic power through human history. It comes because of the central plain, which I was walking right across, between the Yellow River and the Yangtze River. It's an immensely fertile plain. It's surrounded by hills which protected from invaders. So not surprisingly, it was always going to be a place where civilization would flourish. It was so fertile that farmers could actually get two crops per year. One crop that they could use to feed their family, another crop that they could trade. Therein, there lies the prosperity that you see. That passion for education, of course, continues with young people beyond school age, it goes into universities. Two-thirds of the uh, population, of overseas population of universities around the world are made by Chinese. There are 17,000 students attending UK universities from the United States. There are 19,000 uh, that are attending UK universities from India. The figure for China is 90,000. <laughs> What's more, 70 to 80 percent of those young people come back. They come back to China. They don't stay in the West. They come back, they go and get their education, and then they come back, uh, the so-called turtles, who come back because the opportunities are so immense here. Now, the opportunities are fantastic. But that leads us to our next lesson for understanding China from my walk. As I would walk through the towns and villages, I would see everywhere, no matter what time of day, people would be working. But often, they'd be working for themselves. You know, enterprises is very much part of the Chinese dream. Uh, the idea of setting up your own business is an incredibly powerful uh, dream that people have. Many advanced economies have failed because of this reason that as they've gone through their industrial revolution, the big 
industries have sucked in all of the talent to a few small employers and when those industries decline and companies fail as they will there's no new growth left to take its place therefore perhaps one of the most telling statistics that you could find about the new China is this is that the number of new enterprises that started in China doubled between 2010 and 2016. Okay, that's fine. But let me tell you what it doubled to. 1.6 million. Still not impressed? Let me put that in context. 1.6 million new businesses created in China is more than all the new businesses created in Germany, the United Kingdom, and the United States, all rolled together. <laughs> It's an incredible investment in the future because people are optimistic, because people are working hard, and because they're investing in their future of themselves and of others. And amongst those 1.6 million new businesses will be the future Alibaba, the future Huawei, the future Vandar, and perhaps some of the people running them are in this room today. That's what comes when you have a dynamic economy, confident about the future. Let me come back to where I started. My passion. My passion for prosperity, for global growth, uh, for people to be lifted out of poverty. We share that uh, passion, I'm sure. But another one is this, peace. Everything which China has achieved over the past remarkable 30 years years of its growth has come through peace and prosperity. It is important that peace is the other side to the continued prosperity. So on behalf of Sherlin and I, can we thank you for this opportunity and wish you long peace and prosperity which you can share with the world.